Holy oh, shit. It worked. A couple of weeks ago, one of my friends up at our makerspace came to me and said, Hey, look, I have this old PCMCAA card that I need to get some data off of. Is this something you can do? He was already familiar with my predilections for collecting old and vintage hardware, so he knew I'd have something lying around. Sure enough, in my collection cabinet, I have a Toshiba Libretto notebook computer. These computers are wonderful. They were made in the late 90s and are extremely compact for their day. In order to keep things organized, I use plastic ammo boxes to store parts and supplies for my various pieces of equipment. This box has my Toshiba equipment in it. This is a great way to keep things organized and to have things handy when you need to work on something. I keep the spare floppy drives, the power supply, things like that in the box. That way when the machine is on display in my cabinet, it doesn't take up space. Make It Labs in Nashua, New Hampshire is where I hang out with all my other maker slash nerd friends. This is where I heard from my friend John that he had a PCMCIA card that he needed to get read. Once I unpacked the libretto into the main area, we were ready to get started. The libretto has this very weird little DC power supply. This was in a time when laptops and other portable machines hadn't standardized on any particular type of power connector. This one, even for its small size, was remarkably dependable. There were very few of them that I noticed that had broken, even though it was pretty tiny. The libretto has two PCMCIA sockets. One of them, in this case, has the floppy drive controller in it. And what I hadn't realized is the last time I used this machine, I had left a Newton memory card in it. The layout of the cards means that if you have the floppy controller in, you can't actually pull something out of the other socket. So I had to pull the floppy controller out, then the Newton card out, and then put the floppy back in. One of the things you have to be careful of, though, is that Windows gets very cranky if you pull a card out while it's still active, and we'll throw a warning like that. This wizard searches for new drivers for an IDE SD hard disk controller. This isn't going to find shit, but. Yeah, probably has the controller and the disk of the car. I doubt this is going to find anything, but oh, 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 no, I don't want to register it. Fuck off. Yeah, we know that. And then when the power went out, Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a Windows-based machine. Holy shit! It worked.
Oops. John, it worked. I am one well, what you get? We have a file system. Awesome. That's a good thing you have some. Are there files? There are files. Here, let me uh, actually start a the list here. And that's what's on it. That's your list of files. What version of Windows is that? Neat. Windows 98. On this. It that, actually can run 98, huh? Well, the, the kicker is is John brought a, a flash disk in from a, from an old uh, GP, was it a GPS receiver? Yeah. Yeah, okay. It was uh, like for doing mapping. You walk around with an antenna on your head like a Mandalorian, and <laughs> yeah. you got this little thing, and you, <laughs> I am here, I am right. here. Oh, 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 I see. You want to take a look at this? I mean, um, here Could I can. Could you let me, copy the files or something? Uh... Maybe you got a floppy disk? Can you upload them? No, I don't have. Well, I don't know, like maybe. The truth is, I didn't have any floppies. So there was no way to get the data off of the laptop, and the machine didn't have any network connectivity. So I had to bring everything home and come up with a solution on my workbench. What may come as a surprise to no one, this drive wasn't working. I couldn't get it to come ready and bring the floppy online. Fortunately, I had a second drive. So all I needed to do was undock this one and put the other drive in. After a few moments, Windows 98 recognized the new drive and came up with a clean status. We were ready to go. The first floppy I tried spun up correctly, but gave a bunch of errors while trying to read it. I tried a few more times but decided that probably this floppy wasn't going to work. When working with old computers, magnetic media and removable media like this is really the Achilles heel of old systems. They never last and can frequently just stop working for no reason. I decided to use the other floppy I had when I inserted it into the drive and asked for a directory command, there was none of the scraping sounds we heard in the first one. So I was optimistic. And lo and behold, after a little bit of spinning and a little bit of whirring and clicking that is familiar to all of us, we got a directory. Hooray! The drive was working correctly. Because it's always good not to trust the state of an old floppy disk, I decided to do a full format on it. This is obviously sped up, but a reformat of a floppy disk ta usually takes about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Now that we had a working floppy disk, it was time to get the sand disk back into the machine and try to copy the data off of it. Because of the shape of the controller for the floppy drive, I needed to put the sand disk in the bottom slot on the Toshiba. A little bit awkward, but managed to get it into place. If you listen, you can hear Windows 98 recognize the drive. Down in the Windows tool tray, you can see that the PCMCIA card has been recognized by Windows and is ready for use. And here it is in Explorer. It just shows up as drive D. Double clicking on the icon brings up the directory listing and there's all the files that we're looking for. Scrolling through the list though, I started to have a concern. Uh oh, this is going to be a problem. 
This is a 30 megabyte SanDisk, of which about 7.9 meg is in use. A standard floppy disk only has about 1.4 meg of storage. I wasn't going to be able to fit everything on this SD card onto a single floppy. We needed another solution. It was time to go into my box of toys. This is an entire collection of PCMCIA cards that I've pulled together over quite a while. Some from my Newton project, some from other projects, things like that. The problem with most of these cards is they require a set of drivers to be installed on the machine to operate. Normally those drivers come on a set of floppies that come with the card. I don't have those floppies. So the best thing I could hope for is to pick a card that had already been in use on this machine and hope that the drivers were already in place. I couldn't use this wireless card, even though it would be very helpful, because I know that these cards were never used on the Toshiba, so they wouldn't work. This USB controller would be really helpful, but I guarantee this machine has never seen a USB port in the past. So we couldn't use that one, at least for this first try. But these 3COM megahertz cards, I know had been in use before. So I wasn't sure if this machine itself had it, so let's give it a try. These cards require a little dongle that connects into the side of the card and gives you a full RJ45 port. Let's try this one first. We weren't going to need the floppy drive anymore, so I told Windows to shut down the services and then removed the drive from the machine. After inserting the card, it looked like it might work. Windows showed it was going to try to install the drivers, but then it asked for the 3COM floppy disk. I didn't have the floppy disk, so I was stuck. This machine didn't have the proper drivers for this card. Fortunately, I had another Ethernet card, this one by Zircom. I vaguely remembered working with these in the past, so let's see how this one goes. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. It looks like it has the drivers on it. This looks good. It went live. Okay. All I need is an Ethernet cable. Plug in here. Yes, I do. In theory, I'm connected now. Uh. Hmm. Well, the network address. Oh, it, uh, but that's the wrong one. What I really need is... Now, what happens next is an embarrassing sequence of me trying to figure out how to reconfigure the Ethernet NIC to re-DHCP its address. What I hadn't realized during this process is the connection to the Ethernet cable was loose and the card had disconnected physically from the network already. So somewhere during this process of clicking around and doing absolutely nothing at all, it reconnected. What follows is a steady sequence of connections and disconnections from the cable. This is a very frustrating process as it seemed like it would work for a minute and then not work for a few minutes. Some connections worked like the DHCP lease, but I couldn't get any traffic off the network. Eventually, I noticed that the uplink light on the connector wasn't lit. It's not showing a green light there. So something's amiss here. Okay, this connector, this one right here, 
is very temperamental. And I had to wiggle it slightly. But now I have a green light. Let's try it one more time. This wind version of Windows is too old to have a command history. I can't actually hit the up arrow. It doesn't work. Let's try it again. Oh my God, look at that. It's working. Hooray. Now that we were up on the internet, it was time to run up a browser and see if we could use it as a client to upload files off of the libretto to a file server somewhere. Being a very old version of Windows, we really only had one option. Explorer. <laughs> That's funny. Unfortunately, after several tries, it became clear that Internet Explorer was not going to be able to do the job. Because of the age of this machine, all the SSL certificates that it had had expired. So none of the websites would allow it to connect over an SSL connection. After a couple different sites and even trying to get the Chrome browser installed onto this machine, oddly enough, the JavaScript for the Get Chrome site failed, I decided to take a different tack. I took the Raspberry Pi that I used to control my 3D printer, logged into it, and started an FTP server on it. I remembered that Windows came with its own FTP client, so I knew that we already had a client on the machine. FTP was basically the standard for moving files over the internet in the early days. It is an unencrypted, very simple protocol, but allows for some remote control for creating directories, copying files around, and things like that. I was able to remember the commands for turning on binary mode and directory creation, but somewhere I forgot the command called prompt, which will tell the FTP client not to ask for every file transfer when you're ready to transfer. So I had to say yes to every entry, but it worked. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and would like to see more, please click the like and subscribe button down below or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you.